I am joined by Roger Parloff, who comes to you from somewhere in the Jura. He's getting ready to wrap up his tenure as a Makisard, and he is, uh, uh, but he's still in France. Um, Quinta Jurassic, who is coming to you from, is it uh, Greenville, South Carolina? Yeah, I'm. I'm at an undisclosed location. Uh, Quinta Jurassic <laughs> from an undisclosed location that has uh, Russian propaganda, I think, on the walls. Is that right? Um, and of course, Anna Bauer from her palatial mansion, the uh, the DC version. Which room are you in in the in the DC palatial mansion? Um, I like to call this room the uh, snake plant skiff. Uh, it's where I review all of my classified documents that I keep in my palatial mansion. Yeah, I I think that's it's it's always good to have a room for reviewing the classified documents you've absconded with. Um, uh, all right, uh, we have a busy agenda. Um, uh, I, by the way, have been buried in a cave for the last uh, twelve hours uh, for reasons uh, related to. Uh, some public service uh, obligations that I have. And so I'm actually going to ask questions as somebody who is not caught up with any events that happened today. I genuinely don't know the news. So <laughs> this is going to be like for me, uh, I'm going to be the guy who is not briefed, talking to the people who know what the hell is going on. And for any stupid comments that I make, like uh, I did just before we went on live, I said, you know, uh, tr a big surprise. Trump didn't speak at the argument, the closing argument. And Quinta was like, actually, he did. Um, and so for any comments that I make like that, that just reflect ignorance or stupidity or whatever, I apologize in advance. I'm genuinely winging it here. Uh, and I don't usually do that. So Quinta, get us started. Um, what has been going on in New York City as the closing arguments take place in the Trump civil fraud case. Yeah, so today is uh, the final day of the trial of the Trump and the Trump Organization for fraud, um, as you say, in, in civil court, um, in New York state court. And I should say that because I am not in New York and there are not uh, cameras or audio from the courtroom, um, I'm relying here on the work of a great number of intrepid journalists who have been live tweeting. So thank you to them all. Um, essentially, what we heard today is pretty much um, more or less what we would have expected. So the issue in question is whether or not the Trump organization uh, systematically misrepresented the value of its own assets to the tune of over $2 billion. Um, Justice Engeron uh, already granted summary judgment to the New York Attorney General's office on this matter um, several months ago. And so the remainder of the trial has really been been focused on other allegations outside this fraud claim. And then the question of how much the organization is going to need to pay up. Um, and New York Attorney General Tish James has asked for a fine of a whopping $370 million dollars. Um, which is a big increase over what they had initially asked for, which I think was more in the ballpark of $200 million. Um, so Trump's counsel uh, started off the day by essentially arguing a, sort of a number of not particularly interesting legal issues having to do with whether the organization had the requisite intent to defraud. Of course, they argued that it didn't. Um, and whether or not the financial misrepresentations were material, so whether they actually had any effect on the willingness of lenders and insurers to provide the organization with money and insurance. Uh, and then things got a little spicy when Trump himself uh, spoke up. Um, so we there had been some discussion about whether or not Trump personally would make comments during uh, these closing arguments. We had seen this floated in the press previously. Uh, it then seemed like he wouldn't um, due to what transpired over a very amusing email chain that you can find in the New York docket. Um, essentially, uh, Trump's counsel, Chris Keis, uh, requested in an email that was all in, in lowercase, which is definitely one way to write to a judge who's going to be ruling on your case soon, um, saying, you know, Mr. Trump will be speaking as well. Um, 
And Angeron essentially said, you know, yes, okay, that's fine, but you have to be strictly limited to the material that's already in the record. You can't make campaign statements. Uh, you can't, and I quote, comment on irrelevant matters um, or impugn myself, my staff, plaintiff, plaintiff staff for the New York State court system. Uh, so perhaps not surprisingly after that, uh, Trump, uh, Trump's counsel uh, failed to respond to Angeron's requests, and and Angeron then sends an email essentially saying, "If you don't respond in the next seven minutes, I'm not going to let you talk." Uh, they did not respond in the next seven minutes, and we thought that was that um, until at the end of uh, arguments on for Trump's side today, um, they announced that he would like to speak after all, and before Justice Angeron could even weigh in, uh, Trump just started talking, and away he went. Uh, I think he talked for about four or five minutes, calling the case a witch hunt, accusing uh, New York Attorney General Tish James of election interference, saying that Engeron had, and I quote, his own agenda. Um, and that was pretty much that. Um, Engeron just let him let him talk, and then he shut up after a few minutes. So that, that were sort of the big fireworks. Right now, uh, the New York Attorney General's office, they're still uh, going through their closing arguments. So that's still happening as we're recording. So help me out with this, Quinta. But uh, my recollection, and this would be in federal court, not in, in New York state court, but Roger, Anna, if either you guys know the law of contempt on this matter uh, uh, better than I do, feel free to jump in and correct me. It's been a long time since I've thought about this question. But normally when a contempt happened, it doesn't happen in the presence of a judge, right? It happens, um, you know, the judge orders you no, no, you know, talking about my staff and you issue a truth social post. This is the typical case, of course, with a normal person, you, the truth social post. Um, but in this instance, the judge says you can speak as long as you don't do the following things, including impugning myself or my staff. And then Trump stands up and speaks and defies the condition in which he was supposed to have been allowed to speak. I'm, I will say I'm not sure it's quite that's quite right, although I do agree that that is generally a pretty accurate description, because what happened was that. Engeron set out those conditions in the email chain. Uh, Trump's attorneys never consented to them. They just kept saying, oh, we need more time to decide and then not didn't respond to his email. But, it doesn't um, but why does it matter if, well, if well, but, and then, then Engeron said, you're OK, you're not going to speak. And then in the in court, he ended up speaking anyway. So I, I suppose you might be able to argue that those conditions like perhaps weren't operative. I will say I, well, but, I did but, do- some... but, but they weren't operative because he wasn't supposed to be speaking at all. Right. And then he jumped up and spoke. It seems to me either he's violating the terms in which he was allowed to speak or he's speaking without, you know, having been disallowed to speak under the terms in which he wanted to speak. Either way, it seems to me there's a, and this is a, a, a specialized form of contempt. It's a, I, I forget what it's called, but it's a contempt when you actually commit it in the courtroom, in the sight of the judge, and it doesn't require any real due process for the court to point at your ass and say, you're fucking in contempt. And right. so my question is, what did Ngoran do? And what do we know about whether Trump's going to have a problem as a result of this. Well, so, so right. So I, first I should say that, yes, my understanding is that in federal court, um, that does exist as a kind of contempt. I don't know about the New York state court system, although generally judges have pretty broad authority to issue contempt findings. Um, Justice Ingram didn't really do anything. He sort of waited until Trump stopped talking and then that was that. Um, he's definitely been uh, losing his patience, I guess I would say, with the Trump team, but hasn't been as aggressive as he might be in terms of slapping sanctions on them. I mean, I do think it is relevant, um, as some have noted, that this is a bench trial, so there's no jury. So, you know, he doesn't need to worry about Trump prejudicing the jury or anything like that. 
um, which I do think matters. I've also seen some, some suggestion that under New York law, perhaps there might be some way in which allowing Trump to speak um, uh, gets rid of a potential argument that he might raise on any appeal. Um, I'm not familiar enough with the relevant New York law to be able to evaluate that claim, but I could see that, you know, if you're Justice Engeron and you really want to have a ruling that is as ironclad as possible because you know that Trump is going to appeal this as far as it can possibly go, that there might be a reason to kind of give him as much runway as you can to sort of uh, prevent him from making arguments that he was unfairly treated. All, By the way, excellent, there's... all oh. excellent tactical reasons, but I just want to put out there that I think Trump potentially exposed himself today to to a contempt finding, uh, I, I, accepting that the court might choose not to do it for 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 reasons of positioning on appeal. Uh, normally, you don't look a judge in the face and say you have your own agenda and expect to not be slapped with a contempt finding. Roger, uh, and the the email exchange I read. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I, I thought Engeron went so far as to say, and if you violate these rules, I'll fine you $50,000. It would, you know, it's like, and then he violated all of those rules. So, uh, but I, I sort of agree with Quinta that, you know, Engeron may be happy. It's over. You know, it's like why Rule 11 doesn't get used much, you know, um, why create another, which is like um, abusive conduct uh, of uh, litigation conduct. It, it creates a side issue that can itself be litigated and uh, appeals. Why not just go to the meat of the matter? Uh, uh, let, uh, let's let's get to the fine and finish this case. I yeah, so I think that I think that's very th that's probably what Judge Engeron is counseling himself through his anger to do. And because he has so much discretion to in the resolution of the case on the on the magnitude of the fine and the disqualification and the, you know, he has so many tools in his toolbox, he may just say, why increase this? What? Why mess with a piddly fifty thousand dollar contempt fine? I can add a fifty million dollars to the damages and be well within my discretion. Um, and you know, you write a few lines into the opinion about you know the remorseless conspiracy theorizing with which the defendant has engaged. Um, all right, so Q, uh, we have um, uh, this case is now, by the time most people hear this, will have been submitted, and um, we're just gonna, really waiting for him to write an opinion, right? That's right. Um, and I should say, I think it's also worth noting, so the, the big question is, I think, really the amount of money that the Trump Organization may need to pay up. But the the real um uh pain for the trump organization has is already on the table and that is a ruling that justice engeron issued along with that uh summary judgment where he rescinded uh the organization's i believe it's called a business certificate in new york um which limits the the organization and its subsidiary organization's ability to um do business in the state of new york um my understanding is that that could be pretty harsh um, for for Trump, given the number of his real estate holdings that are in the city. Um, so that ruling, it's currently um, stayed by an appeals court. And I imagine that we're probably going to see a fair amount of litigation over whether or not that moves forward. Um, so in some sense, we're sort of, you know, that shoe has already dropped and we're sort of only waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. And what do we know about, I got to say, I know very little about either the, uh, I think there's the New York state system has a two level appeals process. All courts in New York are misnamed, by the way. So if you, if you hear a Supreme Court, that actually means a district court. And if you hear the phrase 
court of appeals, which sounds like a mid-level court. That's actually a Supreme Court. It's it's a crazy system. But what do we know about like how many levels of appeals this goes through and like how long does it take to 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 appeal a New York state judgment? I confess I don't know the answer to that question, in part because, as you say, um, I object to the way that New York names its courts. I think it's ridiculous and they they need to change it. It's also, for example, uh, as someone's noted in the chat, um, Engeron is a justice because he is on the Supreme Court, i.e. the trial court, uh, because New York does everything backwards. Um, so I, not I the can't... Old, they're not the only state that does that. I, I think, think Del- Delaware also too. used yeah. to, but they changed it recently. Yeah, um, it's just designed to... to to mess with reporters and to confuse the public. Um, But in New York's defense on this, it's really, really old. And, um, and, you know, old naming conventions are kind of cool. That's why we love admiralty law, even though we don't really care about admiralty law. The, the name, the, the, the nomenclature is really awesome. It, so, it, so it, I, yeah, what, 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 just one thing, Roger. So admiralty law aside, I will say, I mean, look, this case has been in the running for a really, really long time. I think the investigation began in 2021. Um, everyone in the courtroom, as far as I can tell from the reporting, uh, seems kind of exhausted, not least of whom <laughs> includes Justice Engeron. Um, So if, if this keeps going for even longer, I'm sure that uh, everyone will be thrilled. I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure the appeal goes to the appellate division first department. um, And that's incident. And those people are called justices also, uh, because uh, it's the appellate division of the Supreme Court, the lower court. And um, and then it's appealed to the court of appeal where appeals where people are called judges. But how long that will take, I, I have no idea. And then, of course, you do have theoretically an appeal from the New York Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States. Normally, you would say there is no chance of a cert grant in a routine uh, civil liability you know, business fraud case. On the other hand, it is a Trump case, and um, I wouldn't. So you you're, you're going to have at least two levels of appeal here, and at least and, and theoretically you could have three. Well, they would have to concoct a federal question. Uh, I suppose it would be due process or something like that. Yeah. But, so Chris, I will say during during uh, closing arguments, Chris Keis, I don't have them right in front of me, but he did raise uh, constitutional objections um, to the charges, which I imagine is is setting that up. I will say if I were on the Supreme Court, I mean, they they have the immunity uh, question that's heading to them. They already have the 14th Amendment litigation. I certainly wouldn't want to handle another one of these cases. Um, I can count maybe two justices who might vote to grant cert, but I don't I don't know who the other two might be. So I'm not sure how good Trump's odds are there. Yeah, I don't. I mean, you would you would also presumably have to have some state court that had resolved some federal question differently than the New York Court of Appeals. It's a real long shot. I'm just trying to think about how long, assuming Judge Ngoran rules that, um, uh, you know, Trump has um, massive liability and the Trump organization uh, does as well, how long before, you know, you basically attach the assets or Trump has to liquidate major assets in New York? And the answer is probably a minimum of a couple of years, I would think. I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I uh, reported a podcast that's coming out tomorrow with Tristan Snell, who uh, is a former assistant uh, uh, attorney general in New York. uh, And we discussed this very question. So so folks should listen to the podcast. But um, the his estimation was similar to yours, Ben, that. Uh, very likely that it would take years through the uh, the appellate courts. Um, and he also uh, believed that uh, probably the the judgment would be stayed pending appeal. Um, so uh, yeah, if people can give that podcast a listen when it comes out tomorrow. All right. So here is something that is not going to take years. The Supreme Court's consideration of the meaning of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment 
between the last time we talked and this time, that is to say last Thursday to now, the Supreme Court has granted cert in the Colorado case, um, which means we may not find out really quickly if Trump is going to be banned nationwide from the um, uh, ballot, but we're certainly going to find out pretty quickly whether he is going to be required to be on the ballot in, in all 50 states. Um, so, Roger, what do we know about what the Supreme Court did and what does the briefing schedule look like? Uh, yeah, it, it granted cert and expedited schedule, not quite as expedited as the voter challengers would have liked, but pretty expedited. Um, uh, uh, Trump's brief is due uh, January 18th, so that's next Thursday, um, hopefully before our next trials and tribulations, but but maybe uh, that evening. Um, and then on January 31st, uh, the voter challengers brief will come in. Uh, and then there will be a reply, and then the oral argument will be February 8th. Um, so that's a pretty quick um, uh, what, uh, uh, schedule. The um, uh, Trump had asked for a resolution by March 5th, so they seem to be, and that, that March 5th is Super Tuesday, so they seem to be uh, trying to at least abide by his goal. Meanwhile, um, we will get maybe uh, possibly another state final ruling um, the, in Maine, where Shanna Bellows, also the Secretary of State, determined after the administrative process and taking evidence and holding a hearing also uh, um, uh, that Trump was disqualified, um, followed a lot of the reasoning of the Colorado court. Um, the superior, you, you appeal that to the superior court there, um, and that, the superior court must rule by January 17th, so that's uh, next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, uh, and then the Supreme Judicial Court uh, has only two weeks after that to, to uh, issue its um, ruling on appeal, assuming there's an appeal. So that would be January 31st. So we'll have a final ruling in Maine, uh, I think, uh, before the oral argument. So that will heighten the stakes um, of the oral argument. And just to be clear, the status of, I, like normally in, in, a, in, a, in a normal situation, you would stay the main proceedings, given that you're about to get authoritative guidance from the Supreme Court. But in this case, you can't because Maine has its own statutory obligations to resolve these questions within a certain number of days, right? Exactly, yeah. And and a number of states for uh, voter challenges, because, because time is of the essence, have these very expedited procedures with mandatory rules. Right. So um, are there any other states in which this issue is currently in play or um, is everybody just waiting at this point to see what the Supreme Court has to say other than Maine? Um, I, there are, yes, there are plenty of other states, uh, I, probably 17 or so pending uh, I, 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 uh, I, I can't uh, give a reliable number. Um, there might be, but there are some states like the Oregon, there's a proceeding at the Oregon Supreme Court at this stage, uh, which, which I don't think is likely, excuse me, Oregon. I got somebody from Oregon criticized my pronunciation of, and, and so it's Oregon. Um, so the, the, uh, Oregon that and Nevada. <laughs> Okay. If you ever dare say Nevada in a in a in a forum like this, uh, you will get emails. OK, uh, but I don't think there's a requirement there about when they rule. So it could well be that some of those are awaiting guidance. Yeah, so um, I want to 
aerate a little bit a discussion that you and Quinta and I have been having uh, on email or Slack and sometimes in person in Quinta in my case, um, which involves the question of what happens, and I know people think this is super unlikely, but um, imagine for a moment that the Colorado Supreme Court were affirmed. Um, the court, the Supreme Court does not rule on the facts in this case. Uh, the facts were decided by a district court in Colorado, a state court. Um, they were not the subject of a full-blown proceeding, but a five-day trial in which uh, basically they admitted as evidence the findings of the January 6th committee report. Um, I think that's a little unfair. I, it, 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 only about it, it, uh, there were like 31 findings of the of the of the report. Originally, they wanted to put in 400. The judge narrowed it down, and in the final decision, there's only a maybe 11. Uh, it, it's, okay. So, yeah, it's not. So it, it, there was a trial. There were witnesses. But the point is that that there's no those those factual findings do not bind the Secretary of State of say Mississippi. Right. And and so the weirdness of the this case as it's postured, as I understand it, is that if the Supreme Court were to say, you know, Colorado Supreme Court is right as a matter of law, that given these facts, which are not before us to review, we do, you know, they're, they're within the their reason is reasonable enough for the district court to have found them. This amounts to insurrection and blah, blah, blah. And therefore, the result of that does not seem to me to require that he be removed from the ballot in any other state. It merely says to Colorado, we're not going to interfere with your administrative and court action on grounds that it violates federal constitutional law. And so my question is, what happens then? Do we have a state by state battle in which different courts in different states uh, uh, have their own findings of fact and apply Section 3 accordingly? Um, or is there some mechanism by which that that ruling gets effectuated nationally? Um, I think I do think that the the facts of the case uh, that that the situation is is what you described that the the court the supreme court if it did affirm would be saying yeah you defined you know none of these procedural barriers apply you defined insurrection correctly you just you defined engagement correctly uh the incitement uh, does not is not protected by the first amendment and uh, so it was a reason there wasn't clear error. Uh, we affirm it was reasonable in that respect. That wouldn't bind anyone else. Of course, uh, you could then try to use that using collateral estoppel, uh, saying, you know, you know uh, and full faith and credit, uh, um, tr uh, trying to use collateral estoppel aggressively. But I think other states would still have the wiggle room to say, Trump didn't get a full and fair um, hearing in Colorado. And in fact, there would be an unusually strong case in that three out of seven uh, judges essentially said that. Um, at least that was a portion of the dissents of two of the dissents that there was a lack of due process. And so, uh, yeah, I think it remains, it would remain a mess, which is why there's such pressure on the court regardless of what people think about Trump to avoid a constitutional crisis by trying to uh, uh, rule for Trump on, on something that would finally get rid of this and uh, regardless of how plausible it is. And I think the strongest candidate for that is 
and I've actually changed my mind about this a little bit, just in terms of pragmatism. If that's what they want to do, I think they would go back, have to go back to the section three doesn't apply to presidents. That's the only one, because even if you say section three isn't self-executing, which is the one I thought they would choose uh, as a as an escape hatch. I'm not talking about whether these are convincing. I'm talking about you know if if you're afraid of a constitutional crisis, you're uh, you know or or um, civil unrest, and you want to get rid of this. Um, even so, saying it's not self-executing doesn't solve the problem in terms of what happens on January sixth, twenty twenty five. Because saying it's not self-executing eliminates all the litigation, but it doesn't solve the question, is he qualified? And uh, uh, and so it's just a live, just a very live issue on January 6th and January 20th and thereafter. Quinta? Yeah, I think that's all that is basically right. Um <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I will say just to put on my press critic hat, I do think that the press could be clearer in communicating this. I think there's kind of a perception that the Supreme Court will say yay or nay and the matter will heretofore be done with. Um, and that's just not the case. Um, I do think that I agree completely with Roger that there's sort of one way to end this once and for all, which is to say Trump is not disqualified, whatever route you want to take to to get to that. Um, and even if you sort of try to get rid of it on some cutesy procedural way or say he is, in fact, um, disqualified the, the Colorado affirming rather the Colorado Supreme Court, then you do end up with all of this subsequent litigation um, in state courts and how successful that might be and what that might look like, I think, is frankly a really open question that I don't know the answer to, just because these are 50 different states that have 50 different procedures for letting people get on the ballot. Um, there's a, a very, uh, well, what I think is a bit cutesy argument that was uh, raised in an amicus brief by the National Republican Senatorial Committee suggesting, aha, maybe uh, <laughs> Section 3 prevents uh, insurrectionists from holding office, but it doesn't prevent them from running for office, um, which is a great way to ensure the constitutional crisis that Roger was pointing to um, in terms of, you know, what, what do you really want Congress to do if you show up counting the electoral votes on January 6, 2025, with a, an insurrectionist who may not be qualified to hold office um, winning in the electoral count. So that sort of opens a whole other can of worms. Um, on the, the officer of officer under issue, I tend to agree. I will say the more I read on this, the more, frankly, absurd I find the argument just as a, a matter of evidence and common sense. Um, there's um, Adam Unikowski, whose substack I recommend to anyone who's interested in these issues. Uh, I think dealt with it the best that I've seen anyone deal with it by writing simply, this is why people hate lawyers. Um, it's sort of excessively clever and relies on... Uh, level of distinguishing between prepositions that reminds me of, you know, my sixth grade Spanish class. It just seems ridiculous to put that much uh, significance on the distinction between of and under. Um, but there is an appeal to using it to kind of wiggle out of this jam in particular. Um, and this is something I'm drawing on a point that uh, Will Bode, who co-authored a uh, Law Review article arguing that uh, Section 3 does indeed disqualify Trump with Michael Stokes Paulson has pointed out, uh, if you use the officer argument, it actually only applies to Trump because unlike every other president, he did not previously hold any other public office that would have disqualified him. So there's a particular beauty to the sort of get out of jail free aspect of this argument. I think, I mean, in my view, the the issue with that argument is the same as the issue would be with the Supreme Court writing, you know, that January 6th wasn't an insurrection, um, which is, can you write it with a straight face? Um, you can write it with a straight face, but you can't read it with a straight face. Right. <laughs> and, and there has been a lot of work by a lot of scholars put into 
arguing that this is a distinction that should be taken seriously. Um, and I do think there may be a bit of a missing the forest for the trees argument, but we will see how carefully the uh, textualists and originalists on the court want to parse that distinction. Yeah, so one, a couple thoughts, and then we should move on to Fulton County. Um, one is, you know, for those who haven't marinated in this issue, this is an issue with Section 3 that only arises with respect to the presidency, um, because with all the other offices, all the other federal offices that you might think of, like members of Congress, senators, there's this other procedure, which is, uh, you know, the, the the bodies have the themselves have the authority to seat or not seat members. And so, you know, if it were anybody but the president, you would say the, the Supreme Court would could could very reasonably say, um, hey, this is something that is committed, the, you know, in the absence of implementing legislation, this is something that doesn't sound in ballot access. It sounds in the authority of the body to uh, to consider whether they want to admit, you know, insurrectionist Roger Parloff or Quinta Jurassic or whatever, or Ben Wittes. Um, and that argument was in fact made, uh, Roger, correct me if I'm getting this wrong, on behalf of Marjorie Taylor Greene um, uh, and Matt Gates, I, I believe, right? Uh, they they were, no, not Gates, but um, Taylor oh, no, Greene and uh, Madison right. Cawthorn. Madison Cawthorn. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, and so you, you don't have that argument with the presidency because there is no because it's unitary, there isn't this opportunity to say, well, you know, you, you can run, um, but the presidency doesn't have to admit you. Um, and that's the major. Uh, now, of course, there used to be a way to do that, which was if you took the Electoral College seriously, that you could say an elector who swears an oath for purposes of being an elector shouldn't vote for somebody who uh is constitutionally ineligible. There was a mechanism like that, but then the electoral college became a sort of constitutional formality. And so you can't rely on that anymore. And so there is this uniquely, I think, there's this unique lacuna with respect to the presidency, where as Quinta says, it's completely absurd to say that it doesn't apply to it. But the question of how exactly you apply it and whether you apply it, should apply it through ballot act, state ballot access rules, if, section three doesn't really answer that question. Roger, what am I getting wrong here? Uh, well, I, um, section three also, I mean, it, it, in addition to applying to congressmen and senators who can expel their own members, it applies to a vast number of federal officials uh, and state officials Sure, but there's um, a remedy there too, right? If the uh, if the Secretary of Homeland Security takes some action that affects you, and you don't think he's validly the Secretary the Secretary of Homeland Security, um, you know you don't have to go through this whole impeachment proceeding. You could say, Ali Miorcas, this action that affects me is invalid because Ali Mayorkas is not legitimately, notwithstanding appointment by the president and Senate confirmation, he's an insurrectionist within the meaning of the thing. And you you have standing to raise that, right? Who has standing to raise Somebody that? affected by some action of the, think of like INS v. Chada, right? Oh, oh, um, I see. Mm. Right? Like there's yeah, some, see. there's some rando out there who's, who has personal, uh, who who has injury in fact from some action of a, a federal official, and that official's actions are challengeable um, uh, on grounds that they're not legitimately holding the office that they are. But you can't do that with the president. Well, I I can't really. Uh, I would need to think about that. I th there's a lot of situations and. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think what, what it's it's definitely. Uh, 
I mean, Nick, I mean, Nixon, uh, Trump is in a unique spot because because as as Quintus says, he took one and only oath and it was only as president. Right. And and they've never confronted that before. Um, that puts him in. And so if that presidential oath isn't covered, the game is over. He wins. And and that's what uh, some of these scholars are are arguing. All right. Um, Anna Bauer, let's talk about a super uncomfortable subject, which is um, this week's uh, filings in Fulton County, Georgia. Um, I want to preface this by saying that we have not yet covered this matter on Lawfare. And Anna, I want to ask you to start by uh explaining what the matter is and explaining why we have not yet covered it on Lawfare. Right. So on Monday, Ben, it was the deadline for pretrial motions, except for motions in limine, which are, you know, motions that have to do with what people can argue at trial. Um, other than those types of motions, most of the defendants in Fulton County had this deadline for other pretrial motions that includes things that are akin to a motion to dismiss. So uh, kind of really, you know, things that are dispositive as to whether these charges will go to trial. Uh, and towards the end of the day, around 530, uh, there was a new filing by Mike Roman, who is one of the uh, co-defendants charged in the RICO case brought by Fawny Willis and her team. Uh, and it alleged or it, it requested disqualification of Fawny Willis and her office, including the special prosecutor who she brought on to investigate and then lead the case. His name is Nathan Wade. Uh, it requested their disqualification on grounds or on the allegation that they have been involved in an improper uh, romantic relationship. Uh, the kind of reasoning of, of this motion, you know, beyond alleging this romantic relationship is that uh, Nathan Wade is this outside prosecutor who's been brought in as a contract attorney, basically, and is being paid by the county uh, throughout the course of his uh, uh, work on this case, he's been paid uh, nearly $700,000 over about three years, I believe it's been. Uh, and, and so the idea is that because Fonnie Willis is allegedly engaged in this uh, relationship with Nathan Wade, it creates a conflict of interest because they say that she, you know, uh, receives uh, indirect financial benefits through the, you know, um, through dinners or through trips that they've taken together, uh, and that therefore they have this kind of, you know, incentive to continue prosecuting the case so that Nathan Wade can, can make more money with all of that said, that's kind of the reasoning of the case. Uh, there is nothing in that brief other than, uh, you know, allegations as to whether or not Fonnie Willis has actually been in a romantic relationship with Nathan Wade, uh, either before he was appointed a special prosecutor or afterward. Uh, the brief says that there are documents that could prove this relationship that are under seal uh, in the divorce proceedings that are ongoing between Nathan Wade and his estranged wife, Jocelyn Wade. Uh, and, and, and so that is the kind of reason as to the that is given as to why, you know, supporting documents were not filed. At the same time, there were also no affidavits uh, and, and um, the, there are just allegations that counsel has heard from unnamed sources about this relationship. And so I think that's why we have chosen not to really talk about this issue on Lawfare, or I haven't written anything about it yet, uh, because it seems that in in this in these particular circumstances, there's no you know sworn evidence and and no supporting uh, you know 
documentation about this relationship. And Fonnie Willis hasn't responded yet. She has said that she will respond in an upcoming filing, but we have not seen that yet. And, and so I, I I think it's important and I think that lawfare thinks it's important to, you know, be able to talk about it after we see that response, uh, given the the nature of what's alleged and, and the fact that it doesn't include a whole lot other than just allegations. So uh, that is and Ben, if you wanted to add anything about about that, then feel free to. But that's kind of the reason why we haven't talked about it in detail uh, you know, but there are some things we can talk about it that doesn't relate to uh, the romantic relationship because there are some other interesting things that it has uh, raised, um, including, you know, there, there there is documentation from invoices of Nathan Wade um, that includes uh, itemized lines that discuss, you know, meeting with White House counsel and, and meeting with January 6th. And, and so that has kind of set off a domino effect in which now uh, Trump's team is, is seeking, you know, more uh, information about the communications that the district attorney during the investigatory phase had with White House counsel of the January 6th committee that has long been a kind of talking point for them, of course, is this idea that there's coordination between uh, the congressional committee or the White House. Of course, there's nothing improper about uh, a congressional committee providing, uh, lawfully providing evidence to uh, an investigative agency or, or a district attorney's office. Uh, and there are real legitimate reasons why there might be communications between the White House and a district attorney's office because this case raises issues of executive privilege. And, you know, the executive is the privilege holder in this situation. Um, it also, you know, there's there's certain situations in which you have to get permission to have former officials uh, testify. So we do know that there were something called two E letters, uh, which are like requests that are sent to the Department of Justice to get permission to, you know, have uh, former officials uh, from the Department of Justice that can testify or be interviewed by this the state prosecutor. So there's a lot of reasons why, you know, maybe Fulton County District Attorney prosecutors were meeting with these groups. Um, or talking to them, but uh, it's it's regardless the fact that these by you know these itemized kind of receipts say something about these meetings has been a kind of talking point that Trump's team has latched onto, uh, and and they now want more information about that. So that's one thing that I think we can say about all of this is just that it's having a a, a domino effect that that could impact the case, and you know I'm happy to also discuss kind of how it might affect the indictment. Um, but I will leave it at there for now. And, and Ben, I, you know, I'll take your direction as to whether we should continue the discussion on it. Yeah. I, I just have a couple things that, uh, as to lawfare policy, um, uh, that I would, I want to add to that. The first is it's a motion in a case, uh, that we're covering very actively. We're going to cover it. Um, we're going to cover it either because the allegations have merit, uh, in which case we, uh, at a minimum, it seems like it's inappropriate uh, behavior. It may involve the misuse of government money. So, uh, and it, uh, so at a minimum, it it relates to the uh, propriety of uh, Fonnie Willis's, if true, uh, behavior in office with respect to public funds. Um, uh, we're not going to cover it uh, before we have some sense of whether the alleged facts have uh, are, are in fact merited, and if so, how they are merited. So it is possible that the two of them are romantically involved, and this has no bearing on anything. It's possible that they're romantically involved and she's taken appropriate steps to make sure that the you know the fi public finance stuff is um uh 
uh, you know, that those are cleared by whatever ethics process exists in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, right? And it's possible, of course, that it's completely untrue or that, as Mike Roman alleges, that it's true in a fashion that affects his due process rights somehow. Though, by the way, it's complete. There's no th that connective tissue is completely unapparent from the uh, from the motion that he filed. Um, uh, um, so my view is uh, we're not going to pretend it's not there. We're talking about it right now. But there's no point in eval trying to evaluate it. Um, without her response and without some sense of what the supporting documents are. And you would cover it very differently if she filed a brief that said, there's no basis of fact for any of this. I'm an officer of the court and I'm telling you these factual allegations are false. Then if she says, yes, it's uh, true, we're romantically involved, but the ethics office of the such and such said, fine, well, you know, whatever. Um, these are very different fact patterns and you would cover them very differently. And so it seems to me the better part of valor is just to wait until we have some sense of uh, what what the reality is. We are going to cover it. We're just going to wait until we can do it responsibly. Yeah. yeah. And I will say, you know, I I I kind of put it as like we're waiting for her response, but it's it's not necessarily that it's waiting for some kind of supporting documentation or or something to give us a better sense of um, the accuracy of the allegation. Uh, her response to that, at a minimum. Yeah. To to that end, I will say I one thing I can say is that I received a press release earlier today from uh the woman who is has ongoing divorce proceedings with Nathan Wade. Of course, that divorce is relevant to all of this because it is allegedly uh, in that case where some of this supporting documentation is, but that case is, is under seal of the court, meaning that the documents uh, can't be viewed by the public. Um, and, and earlier today, Jocelyn Wade, the uh, estranged wife, uh, through her team, sent out a press release stating, you know, they're not going to comment on this except through uh, court filings, because, of course, they've received a lot of inquiries about um, the case or, or the divorce proceedings. Uh, but they did uh, say that there has been um, a hearing set in the divorce proceeding on January 31st about the matter of un potentially unsealing the uh, case. The, the attorney for Mike Roman, Ashley Merchant, said in her motion that she was seeking to have the case unsealed. So there will be a hearing on that uh, January 31st. Uh, and, and so it may be after that that uh, there will be more information that, um, you know, will will give us an indication of kind of what the supporting documentation is. Yeah, so. I, there is one thing about this that beyond what Anna and I both just said that I feel very strongly about uh, came up this morning on uh, in my conversation with Charlie Sykes on the Bulwark podcast, um, which is that, you know, one thing that we can talk about at this point is the way the Trump world people are reacting to this, which has a real echo in the Pete Strzok, Lisa Page, text messages stuff, um, which, you know, for my sins in life, I was, uh, I'm very close to both of them and have been a close advisor to both of them in lots of things. And, um, you know, I cannot pretend to be neutral on that subject. They're, they're dear friends of mine. Um, look, the, um, the central feature of Trump's public relations response to all things other than projection is changing the subject to make it about conspiracies against him. Um, and the more salaciously sexual, the better. Uh, and the, um, and the, already you are seeing a very similar uh, vibe in the way the saturation coverage of this motion in certain 
uh, Trump world circles and um, and it really is very similar to the way they responded to the tr struck page text messages, which like this, it was completely non-obvious how, if at all, it affected the conduct of the uh, of the Russia investigation. And by the way, when the inspector general finally um, uh, got around to uh, considering that matter, found that, you know, he couldn't find any evidence that, that it affected any, that their supposed bias had affected any decision. Um, and so, you know, I do think it is really important, Quinta, and I'd love your thoughts on this, to not fall into the trap of assuming, even if true, that, that there's something wrong with what Bonnie Willis did, and we will reserve judgment on that until we're in a position to address it, um, that this has any bearing on the conduct of this case. Um, and so my question is, am I responding to this very emotionally because I'm? Uh, it just echoes in the way Pete and Lisa were treated? Uh, or or uh, what do you think? You were a close observer of that whole thing as well. Yeah, for my sins. Um, I, I think I disagree slightly with you. Um, in my view, the issue with the struck page story was in part that the contents of their personal commun or personal communications, albeit on government devices, um, were released to the press by the deputy attorney general, um, by the Justice Department. And um, his, his public affairs uh, Correct. Director, um, you now sainted Sarah Isker Flores, who, may it be written on her tombstone, invited the press in in the middle of the night to review these text messages on condition that they couldn't say that there was a reading room at the Justice Department at which to do that. Yes, I'll also note that she was uh, the press flag at the Justice Department during the period when family separations were being carried out. Um, uh, but so I, the, those communications were released. Um, I know Struck and Page have both argued in court that that was in violation of the Privacy Act. I'm not actually sure where that litigation has ended up. Um, but it was arguably a breach of their privacy. Um, and there was never at any point any serious allegation that their conduct had any actual effect on the investigation. Um, which I think is really key. It was sort of a airing, an aggressive airing of dirty laundry in order to cast aspersions in ways that did not speak at all to the substance of the investigation, the way that it was conducted, um, any of that. And I should emphasize that the uh, Ju Justice Department Office of Inspector General report um, more or less uh, concluded as much. Um, there's no evidence that anyone's actions actually were affected in any way um, based on the the political views that were expressed in those text messages. And I, I, I have to say, I actually think that that is a substantially different scenario than what's being alleged here, which is a pretty massive financial, potential fi financial conflict of interest. Um, and I have seen... Um, uh, so Andrew Fleischman, who's a Georgia defense attorney and follows Fulton County closely, has said that in his view, at least, um, this is, you know, potentially really concerning for what it says about conduct in the prosecutor's office. Um, and so while I'm not familiar enough with the allegations and with Georgia law, um, I do think that there is more, much more of a hook here than there ever was with the struck page story. And as with the struck page story, where the attention always should have been on the question of, you know, what effect did this actually have on the investigation? And the answer there seems to have been, after a pretty exhaustive amount of digging, uh, none, um, that it makes sense for the focus here to be what effect has this had on, on uh, the investigation and on the functioning of the DA's office. Um, rather than, you know, any salacious details that may surface about the conduct of the individuals in question. All right. I take that. Um, I still do not understand how there is alleged to be connective tissue. If, assuming the worst, assuming it's all true, 
there's a bar issue for Nathan Wade and for uh, for uh, Fonnie Willis, and maybe there's a criminal misappropriation, expropriation of public money issue. I don't understand how any of that affects the facts alleged in the indictment. Uh, Anna, is am I missing something here? No, I, I think that you're right, Ben. It's I, you know, th there's I, I and I and I see Quinta the argument that this if true and I, I you know, I don't want to get into too much speculation about this again, just because we're talking about something that we have no idea if it is true or not. But uh, assume even assuming the conduct alleged. It is a it shows at the very least uh, a real lack of judgment on the part of Fonnie Willis and the special prosecutor, um, and and they will have to face the political or potentially legal ramifications of that, uh, as you said, Ben, as it relates to potentially the bar or other consequences. But as to this case, I, I do not see how it prejudices the rights, uh, the constitutional rights of the defendants in this case. I have not seen anything that connects, uh, you know, this to the, the case as like in particular. So I, I'm with you, Ben, that I just, I'm very doubtful that it will actually impact this indictment, but uh, it, it, it certainly does um, even, you know, not knowing what uh, Fonnie Willis's response is or what the supporting documentation is going to be, uh, we can say that it has very much affected this case politically and, and the narrative that uh, Trump is, is you know, crafting around it. So um, it, it has big, you know, uh, issues. There's something there, but it's, I just don't know whether it's going to have I'm pretty doubtful it'll have legal uh, ramifications for the indictment itself. Right. Um, well, we we will find out, and we uh, we will cover it, whatever it turns out to be, when we are in a position to do so responsibly. Really quickly, because I don't, I know we're going to move on to questions, but I will just say other the Mike Roman news overshadowed a lot of other filings in Fulton County. Uh, so uh, there will be a hearing tomorrow on some motions. Those are some of the smaller uh, kind of, you know, discrete issues like Trevion Cuddy or Cootie has has lost her um, uh, her, her counsel seeking to withdraw um, things like Rudy Giuliani wants to interview Jenna Ellis and Ken Chesbro and all of those folks who have pleaded out. Um, and we also saw some motions from Trump's team that largely track a lot of the motions that he has filed in the federal case. Uh, probably the you know one that is the most notable is the presidential immunity motion that they filed that uh, is, you know, if that goes to the Supreme Court, it will be decided by the Supreme, the, excuse me, the, if the DC circuit decision ends up going to the Supreme Court, then it kind of doesn't really matter what happens in Georgia because uh, it's going to be decided by the Supreme Court. But if the Supreme Court, you know, if it's just the D.C. Circuit, you know, that's not binding on Judge McAfee or Georgia courts. Uh, it would certainly be persuasive, but it, it could be up to Georgia courts to decide differently from the, the D.C. Circuit. Um, and so then we would probably see I mean, I would be, uh, you know, I, again, it's interlocutory appeals in Georgia are discretionary. So Judge McAfee could, you know, say, no, I'm not going to accept this motion. Um, and, and then it might be the kind of thing that Trump has to wait until after uh, the trial, unlike in, in the case in, in D.C. So we will see. But just wanted to note those few things there at, in terms of Fulton County happenings that don't relate to the Mike Roman filing. All right. We're going to go to audience questions. There are 15 questions in the queue. We're going to try to get through as many of them as we can. Before we do, uh, Roger and Anna anything else happen in either dc or south florida that we need to take note of this week well ob obviously there was the uh uh the well, argument yeah there was the, the oral argument <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> See, uh, we did a whole separate yeah. live stream about that. And so we're just going to incorporate that by reference here. Uh, oh, yeah, there was a DC Circuit oral argument. See uh, our discussion of that from Tuesday. Anything else? Um, th there's one little thing in the in the Southern Southern District of Florida case. Um, you know, there was a routine filing, a, a joint um, discovery status mm -hmm. report. Um, and they mentioned uh, that the government mentioned that 2000 pages uh, of stuff that had been classified is now unclassified. Um, and some of that might be stuff that was originally part of a classified document that never really needed to be classified. But part of it, they said, has been declassified because it no longer needs to be classified. And 2,000 pages, the, the, I, if I'm counting right, there were only 5,600 uh, pages of classified material um, uh, that were have been made uh, available so far in this case, mainly the 32 documents that were willfully withhold. So making 2000 pages unclassified is, you know, it's about 35%. Um, it's a hell of a way to deal with the SEPA issues. It if is. You, if you it, don't like your chances in front of Judge Cannon on SEPA issues, making a discretionary judgment, you know, let's declassify the shit out of this stuff. It's It takes a lot of power out of her hands. It requires... Uh, a lot of handholding with certain agencies that may be the classification authorities on those uh, um, uh, um, matters. Yeah. All so right. The, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, that was exactly my speculation. Okay. We are going to get through as many of these questions as we can. We are also going to finish sharply at 530 because somewhere in the Jura, Roger is, you know, a lot of hours ahead of us and it's getting late there. Um, so um, uh, please uh, ask your answer, pose your question in the form of a question and uh, briefly, and I'm going to ask everybody and hold myself to this. We're going to take one answer and one answer only without additional thoughts from other panelists, including me. Uh, and uh, uh, please keep your comments brief. Matt C., the floor is yours. I'll try and talk fast. So my question goes to the disqualification case. And um, I'm not in charge of all the different textual arguments being made in that case for why Section 3 doesn't apply to the presidency. But I think one of them is that the presidency isn't an office, you know, quote, under the United States in that particular phrase. And I happened to be reading over the weekend, just hanging out, reading the impeachment judgment clause, apropos of nothing. And, and I noticed that it uses that phrase. It says that if Congress convicts an officer or, or impeaches an officer, excuse me, it can bar him from holding you know, any office of trust or whatever under the United States. And then I didn't know a lot of constitutional law when I was a third grader in the Nixon administration. But, but one thing I did know, I think, is everyone understood that clause to say that you know, if, if, if the president were impeached, Congress could prevent him from ever running again for president. And it seems like that wouldn't be the case under this reading of the clause. And so I guess my question is, one, can that possibly be right? I, mean, I don't know if that was raised in the briefing or by the lower court, but it seems wrong. And two, you know, it, at some point, doesn't it get a bit silly to kind of like do all the, I understand these arguments being made on a hypertextual basis and there's some support for them, but at some point, it seems like you just kind of need to stand back and, and take a common sense view of this language. But that, those are my two questions. Roger? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, this, you're right, there are two different arguments. Um, the, the people that are most, that have really most championed one of these arguments are, the, are, are uh, Josh Blackman and Seth Tillman. And they have submitted already uh, an amicus brief in the Supreme Court. And remarkably, they take the position for exactly the reason you just mentioned, that uh, the impeachment judgment clause, uh, the, uh, um, that a president cannot be disqualified. 
a, a, only lesser officers can be, uh, you know, unelected officers can be disqualified through impeachment. So they take the position, no, uh, that w what you assumed all along is false. I think they actually testified to that effect in the second impeachment. Um, they also take the a position that a president can accept foreign emoluments um, because uh, the language is similar in that provision. There are a lot of surprising things uh, which they uh, accept. It, it gets weirder than that um, because uh, there are these two phrases, uh, office, officer of the United States and office under the United States. And these two leading authorities that are really uh, the, the, the driving force behind this argument, they say that in 1788, neither of these phrases referred to the president. They say that when you get to 1868, when section three is ratified, it is clear to them that officer of the United States still doesn't include the president. It is not clear to them whether or not office under the United States includes the president. It, it, is, it is really uh, in the weeds, heavy duty stuff, uh, and, it, and it leads to a lot of strange results. But I think these guys have been articulating this argument since at least 2014 um, in other contexts. So I don't think they made it up for, uh, you know, to get Trump off. Yeah, I um, mean, uh, Josh Blackman was making this argument with respect to the emoluments clause uh, all through the Trump administration. Um, and it, whatever, whatever it is, it is not a bespoke argument crafted for this particular yeah. purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michael, the floor is yours. So hypothetical. Let's suppose Trump is elected and at least one of the criminal cases is still going on. It, he then directs DOJ to drop the case and DOJ accedes to that request. Is the court then compelled to end the trial or can the court disagree with DOJ and insist that the trial continue? And if it's the latter, how, how does that play out? Um, all right. So the answer to this question, this came up in the Flynn case, actually, in the Michael Flynn case, where Bill Barr decided to drop the matter that Flynn had actually already pled to. Uh, you know, so he so this was a, a still more advanced stage. Um, and the judge in the case was infuriated by uh, both Flynn's uh, uh, sort of reneging on his plea deal, but also then the uh, was very suspicious of Bill Barr's decision to drop the matter. And he held a number of hearings on it. Um, and uh, then it was um, uh, mooted by the fact that Trump pardoned Flynn. Uh, so he never actually ruled on it. Uh, that said, I think everybody sort of believed, and certainly I did, that the court has no authority ultimately to force the Justice Department to continue a prosecution that it doesn't want to continue. And um, that, you know, that that is a, a, a matter that is entrusted to the executive branch. Uh, and so my assumption was that the district court in that case would have to eventually dismiss the case, could wave his arms about it a little bit, but wouldn't be able to resist that. And if the if he tried, the DC Circuit would make very short work of that. That was my assumption, and it remains my assumption here that there is no there is no reasonable world in which pre-conviction anyway, it's a different matter once you're once you're post-conviction and sentencing and you have a final judgment, um, then it is up to the court whether to vacate it. But um, uh, pre-conviction and pre-final judgment, the Justice Department has essentially unlimited discretion to drop a case. And 
Uh, I don't think that would be, uh, I, I, I don't think there's any world in which Trump gets elected and the attorney general wants to drop a case against the president that he serves and the courts prevent him from doing that. That's my assumption. Uh, if anybody disagrees, speak up. I th I thought it was a little fuzzier still, but but then then there's also pardon pardon trickery in case that doesn't work. There's right. you know you can you can say I, I'm not I'm I'm ill I'm I'm asking the vice president to take over for the next three hours. And then during that period, the vice president grants you a pardon and then you feel better again and you can, you know, that sort of thing. So I, I have no, you know, given who Trump is, given the, the, the mastery he has over the Republican uh, leaders in Congress, uh, I have no doubt that he can somehow get rid of these cases to go away if he becomes president. Whoops, other Michael, the floor is yours. But you gotta unmute yourself. Uh, all Am right, I unmuted? Well, uh, uh, you, we can hear you now. So uh, my question is why doesn't the 2021 impeachment proceeding provide the evidence needed to assume Trump disqualified under Section 3. The article of impeachment he was charged with was literally incitement of insurrection, and a majority of senators voted that he was guilty. Isn't that enough? Let me turn the question around. Given that the standard for conviction is not a majority of senators, it is a, um, uh, a supermajority of senators, and he was 10 votes short of that, why does the acquittal not uh, show that at least for purposes of impeachment, he was not uh, an insurrectionist? For purposes of impeachment, he was not, he did not meet the standard, but isn't the section three bar lower? Um, it would be redundant if, uh, this, the, as applied to officers subject to impeachment, the section three clause would mean nothing if, uh, if yeah, a majority but, vote of Cong the Senate is not enough, right? But let me ask you a different involved. question then. So why why um, is it up to votes of members of the Senate um, as to whether somebody engaged in insurrection? The Section 3 textually commits to Congress the ability to remove the disability, but the disability is on the face of the text imposed by the text itself. It isn't subject to the, you know, how how members of the Senate feel about it. I would call it a persuasive authority, right? If the senators felt this, I mean, think about the people who wrote the 14th Amendment. Think about somebody who um, qualified and got got that kind of uh, vote by the Senate. Would not um, would not those people think? That's someone who's disqualified. What do you think, Roger? What do you think the chances are that the Supreme Court says, you know, we take judicial notice of the, the solid majority of senators, and while not bound by that, it's persuasive authority that this is, you know, an insurrection, at least as far as the majority of the Senate thinks about it. Well, I mean, it's not. Uh, we also know how the Congress, thought, uh, House, thought about it too. <laughs> Majority of the House agreed. Um, so it, it was both chambers. Um, it's an, you know, I don't think it's preposterous. We're all sort of in no man's land with this with this Section Three. Um, you know, if it were a different Supreme Court, I think that's conceivable. Uh, I just don't think it's conceivable with this. Supreme Court. All right. Catherine asks, how relevant is the Mies Calabresi amicus brief regarding Smith's appointment now uh, not valid, being not valid since there was no oral argument? And Sauer said, while it was a good issue, he was not raising it. Is it dead in the water now? Quinta, this, this question has your name written all over it since you and uh, 
uh, Professor Calabresi have a bit of a history. Um, and I'm just going to drop this one in your lap and you do with it as you will. Yeah, so what, what Ben is referring to here is uh, in 2017, 2018, um, I worked with George Conway to edit a lawfare piece of his uh, that I would say pretty effectively dismantled um, and then drove a truck back and forth over the dismantled pieces of the same argument, I think, that Calabresi is making here, which Calabresi had made then regarding uh, the constitutionality of Robert Mueller's appointment. Um, George, it's worth noting, was writing that from the point of view of someone very firmly ensconced within the conservative legal movement. Um, so I think it is probably fair to say that this argument is not going to get very far. <laughs> um, there are excellent arguments against it, particularly uh, from a perspective that I imagine a number of the justices on the right uh, would find quite convincing. Um, I should also note that Professor Calabresi has been uh, uh, productive when it comes to making arguments against these these various cases uh, against Trump. He's also waited on the 14th Amendment issue, including on the officer issue and the insurrection issue. Um, so there's a although there's not a body always of on work. the same side of the uh, uh, he he's argued both sides of the 14th Amendment issue, as I recall. Yes, he's changed his mind. Um, let me just add that if you want to know what's wrong with the Calabresi Mies argument. Um, in the current context, reading George's response uh, to the uh, um, to the same argument as applied to Bob Mueller that Quinter refers to, which is uh, it's a developed article on Lawfare from a few years ago, is a very good place to start. And the reason that people are not spending a lot of time on this argument, and I can promise you the D.C. Circuit will not uh, it will not figure in the D.C. Circuit's resolution of the current matter, uh, is that the argument is dumb. Um, and, 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 well, sorry, let me amend that. The argument is not is not merely wrong. It is flamboyantly wrong. Um, uh, the I, It's not appropriate for me to engage in that kind of ad hominem. So I will just say not just not just wrong, but really, really wrong. OK, um, Marsha. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, on the assumption that at some point somebody might just say enough is enough, um, I'm wondering what might happen if some state um, puts Trump on or off the ballot in defiance of a Supreme Court decision. Roger? Hmm. Uh, uh, I, uh, I guess I'm a little stumped. All right, I'll take a quick crack at that. So as we said earlier, the Supreme Court's not going to order every state to remove him from the ballot. If it were to affirm Colorado, it would affirm that there's not, it would merely say that Colorado's removing him does not violate the Constitution, not, um, do, you know, is, is compliant with Section 3. That would not require that every other state do the same thing. Um, there would have to be subsequent litigation. So I don't think you're going to see a Supreme Court order ordering states to remove Trump from the ballot. Um and so I don't think we are, I, I think the, 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 the question presupposes a factual. Um, well, uh, the, the, uh, the, the opposite half of her question, though, would, would uh, still be valid. That what if they say Section 3 doesn't apply to presidents and some states say, don't give me that. <laughs> we, we know what it says. He's not on our ballot. So then what happens? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I know the answer to that question either. <laughs> um, uh, but but I but I do think we shouldn't jump to the assumption that um, 
that there's going to be a Supreme Court order here to defy. Um, all right, we have five more minutes, and uh, we're going to get through at least two more questions. Should Senator Schumer vote hold a vote in the Senate to remove Trump's visibility under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? It seems like it could be an interesting political stunt for him to pull since Republicans could be put in the position of admitting that Trump engaged in insurrection if they vote to remove the disability or standing against Trump if they don't. Um, I'm going to take this one myself. I love this idea. Um, and I love it because uh, I think it's, you know, running the Senate is partly about political showmanship. And if you want as a uh, political showman, uh, of which the Senate majority leader is, to show that uh, to to create hard votes for the other side, that's uh, you know a legitimate thing. And if you find one that's kind of win-win, Democrats aren't going to support it, so it wouldn't um, uh, it it wouldn't pass. Um, but it could uh, you know be a decent messaging bill. Um, and if by the way, if it doesn't pass. Then you have an argument to the Supreme Court. The set, one house didn't even vote on removing his disability. The other house re voted on it and rejected it. So I think it's clever. Uh, is it going to be the deciding factor in the case? No, um, but that's okay. Um, so the great Genevieve Delaferra, who uh, uh, was one of our co-hosts on In Lieu of Fun, asks: um, Does the executive privilege apply? Uh, continue to lie with Trump, or would it be covered by President Biden's waiver of executive privilege? Uh, so, Quinta, uh, you know the answer to this question. Um, and um, uh, uh, what it, what is it? Uh, I'm not sure I do because I'm not sure what the context is. Um, so, there there had been a fight. Um, over invocation of privilege uh, earlier in the January 6th investigation um, where Trump had tried to argue that he could invoke the privilege after uh, the Biden administration had, I think, technically not waived it, but declined to invoke it. Um, and the determination in that instance was that uh, Biden's decision goes, <laughs> essentially. Um, so that that's the answer in that context. Um, I think believe if I'm remembering correctly that the legal analysis was sort of specific to that situation, the materials that issue the way the Biden administration chose to handle it. Um, but broadly speaking, um, though there may be some uh, interest in maintaining the privilege that a former president has, it seems like the uh, decision of a sitting president to waive or not to invoke the privilege is uh, probably going to be dispositive. Yeah, that is the correct. There are four great guiding rules of all executive privilege privilege claims. And if you keep that in mind, you will uh you you will get them get all executive privilege questions right 98% of the time. One is executive privilege uh is essentially absolute with respect to Congress and external actors. Um it the executive will almost always prevail in those in those contexts. Number two, executive privilege will almost always fail in the face of a grand jury in a criminal context. Um, not always, but almost always. Number three, the executive privilege cannot be asserted uh, uh, or the 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 attorney client, the internal attorney client privilege, of the executive branch cannot be asserted in front of a grand jury. And number four, while the former president can assert executive privilege in the former president, the, the current president is the ultimate controller of the privilege. If you keep those four rules in mind, you can figure out the answer almost always to almost all the way the courts will handle almost all executive privilege questions. There are some nuances but those rules are going to, they're going to work. All right. It is 530. We're going to leave on time today. You are all great Americans. Thank you to Roger. Get some sleep. 
Thank you to Quinta from her undisclosed location. Thank you to Anna Bauer from the Snake Plant Skiff. And uh, I am Ben Wittes, bidding you adieu from the hammock studio. We will see you 